Good morning, Vietnam! shouted Robin Williams in the film of the same title. It was meant to wake up the residents of the military camp, but in a figurative sense, it referred to the whole southeastern Asian country. After the American troops had pulled out, new days dawned in the reunited country. It's true that the Republic struggles with economic problems even today, but the decades that have passed since the end of the Vietnam War have created a foundation for development. While even the name of the neighboring Thailand proudly contains Land of the Free, it's never been a colony. In the meantime, Vietnam has survived French as well as American invaders. Don't be surprised that tourism has started to develop only recently. Today, more and more tourists visit this Indo-Chinese country to get to know its 2,700-year-old past, monuments, and wonderful natural beauties. The sun rising above the sea finds the hard-working Vietnamese awake. Many of them start the day with meditation, yoga, or gymnastics, and many follow the tradition of Eastern martial arts. Those living next to the sea often take a morning dip in the water, which is still rather cool at this time of the day. Most of them ride a bike, which has the advantage that it doesn't pollute the air and there aren't traffic jams, even in big cities. The panorama of Asian countries contains bright green terraced rice paddies. Rice is a basic food and is used in many Asian dishes, from soup to side dishes, one-dish meals to desserts. Hanoi was built in the northern part of the S-shaped country on the bank of the Red River, west of Halong Bay. The city was the capital of French Indochina between 1902 and 1953, later the capital of North Vietnam, then after 1976, the capital of the whole country. It grew into a metropolis with 3.5 million people out of a small riverside village. Its development is due to the fact that in 1010, the emperor had a palace for his royal court built here and he made the settlement the capital city of the country with the name Tang Long. The name means lifting dragon and is in close connection with the legend of the foundation of the country. The sites of Hanoi are focused on the Big West Lake and Hoan Kim Lake. Local people like doing sports playing chess or sitting in the parks around the lakes. It's trendy to fly a kite and play badminton, both of which are ancient Chinese inventions, but due to globalization, we can also meet young people with skateboards or on motocross bikes. We can hire a scooter or a bike or sit in a paddle boat. The Chua Trang Quoc Pagoda stands on the small island of West Lake. It's the oldest pagoda in Hanoi, was reconstructed in 1842, and has remained in this form till today. All 12 floors were decorated with statues of Buddha, its turned-up roof was covered with shiny tiles. The area east of the pagoda is called Old Town, although it has no authentic monuments. In fact, there are hardly any old buildings at all. It's the descendant of the former trade quarter, and here you can find Textile Street, Shoe Street, Rice Street, Paper Street, or Pot Street. The street names no longer designate the products sold here. The picture is more chaotic than that. At any rate, the wide range of products is huge, and the atmosphere is very exciting. According to legend, a dragon and a fairy lived in this area with their 100 sons. Once the dragon said, I'm a dragon, you're a fairy, so our ways must part. 
The fairy, with her fifty sons, moved into the mountains, while the dragon, with the other fifty sons, stayed on the coast. The kings whom, the first rulers of Vietnam, declared themselves the descendants of the dragon. We can encounter this legend all over the country, for example, in the famous Landing Dragon's Bay in the Ha Long. Hanoi was a trade center even before Emperor Li Tai To. In the settlements situated in the meeting point of three rivers, there were already markets in the 5th century. In the 6th century, Li Bi built a fortress made of pales and bamboo to protect them from the Chinese. In 1010, the emperor's court moved here, and the rulers lived in the Forbidden City till 1802. Emperor Li Tan Tong had the Church of the Empire, the Van Mu, built in 1070 in honor of Confucius. The university set up by him operated as a kind of state administration college training bureaucrats. From the Middle Ages, exams in Mandarin and competitions for academic degrees took place here. In memory of Confucius' 82 students, 82 turtles, carved out of 82 stones, stand here, with a plate of stone on their backs listing the names of those students who passed the Mandarin exams. The city, then called Thang Long, was a large construction site in the 16th century. Let Tuong Duc, fond of splendor, extended the imperial quarter. The parks next to the rivers and lakes, which can be seen even today, were set up at this time. The dam that created Lake Truk Bak detached from West Lake, was also built then. In the next century, Tang Long became a double center, the seat of the Le Kings and Trin Lords. This brought along the fast development and blossoming of the city, since catering to the needs of the two courts necessitated more workers, craftsmen, and traders. The settlement Bat Trang, which was famous for its ceramics industry, joined the city in these years. Foreign traders appeared one after another, maintaining storehouses and depositories here. But prosperity comes to an end sooner or later. In the 19th century, Jia Long made Hue the capital city. Trang Long stopped existing, and from this time on, it was called Bak Tan, Northern Fortress. Although it lost its political role, it maintained its commercial importance, and Chinese tradesmen, craftsmen, and traders settled down here. The city, which kept growing, was called Hanoi from 1831. From 1902, it was the capital of French Indochina. The British writer Cecil Lewis thinks, roofs lined up behind each other resemble capsized boats and all of them twinkle in the sunshine. Chinese architecture seeking harmony of landscape and buildings influenced Vietnam's pagoda architecture as much as the architecture of Thailand and Cambodia. The layout of the pagodas follows the traditions of Feng Shui, which is flourishing again today. The science of wind and water seems to create harmony everywhere, and it places an especially high premium on the relations between nature and the buildings made by human beings. The architecture of pagodas flourished between the 6th and 9th centuries, spreading in all countries in the Far East. The oldest remaining brick pagoda was built in 520 and was found in China, but some Vietnamese buildings are not much younger either. The churches are generally located north-south, and especially the construction of their roofs is unique. Based on their exteriors, it's difficult to say whether they're Taoist, Confucianist, or Buddhist temples. Taoism is a faith interwoven with Chinese philosophy and healing. Confucianism isn't really a religion, although it has a connection with the Indochinese ancient cult, which provides the soul of the dead with peace through various rituals. Confucius followers may become Taoist or Buddhist. The most widespread religion of the region is Buddhism, which came from India in the first century. Three branches of Buddhism are distinguished, Chinese, Tibetan, and Pali Buddhism. 
93% of the religious Vietnamese are Buddhists, and 7% of them are Catholics, thanks to French schools and priests. But atheism is gaining more and more ground. An interesting attempt to be found only here was born in the country, Kadoism. Graeme Greene writes the following about it in his novel, The Quiet American. Once a year, Kaodaists have a feast in their holy seat, Tay Nin, 80 kilometers northwest of Saigon. They're always celebrating the anniversary of a liberation or a conquest or some sort of Buddhist, Confucianist, or Christian festival. Kaodaism is always one of my favorite chapters when I give a lecture about Vietnam to foreign visitors. Kaodaism, coming from spiritualism and uniting three religions, is a Cochin Chinese state official's invention. The Museum of Fine Arts, which displays the works of Vietnamese artists, can be found near the Church of Literature. Ho Chi Minh means enlightened. The mausoleum of the leader of the Vietnamese National Movement stands in Ba Dinh Square, where he once proclaimed the independence of the country. The statesman asked in his will to be cremated, but his descendants erected a mausoleum for him, designed similarly to Lenin's mausoleum in Moscow, in which his mummified body is displayed in a glass coffin. Ho Chi Minh was born on the 19th of May, 1890, under the name Yugen Tat Tan, as a poor teacher's son. He lived in poverty during his adolescence, was given a Confucianist education, and finished grammar school supported by the French. He was a sailor for three years on a French steamship. From 1915, he lived in London, then in France. He worked as a gardener, waiter, photographer, and fireman. In Paris, he got in touch with communists, and he spent a short time in Moscow. In China, the Vietnamese Communist Party was set up under his leadership. On the 2nd of September, 1945, he proclaimed the independent Vietnamese Democratic Republic in front of a huge crowd in Hanoi. 24 years later, on the 2nd of September, 1969, he died. Until his death, he was the country's president and prime minister. One example of his popularity is that his nickname was Father Ho. In his house, a museum in his remembrance has been set up. Opposite the War History Museum, a statue of Ho Chi Minh's ideal, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, can be seen. The War History Museum, standing at the bottom of the flag tower, is a part of the Hanoi Fortress. The exhibition displays the relics of the war against the Americans. In the yard, big war equipment, tanks, anti-aircraft and artillery cannons, and crashed planes are shown, as they wouldn't have found room in the exhibition rooms. The showcases display various relics, small arms, posters, and photographs. Despite the 33 years passed since its end, the Vietnam War is the first thing to come to mind if we mention Vietnam. Of course, this is partly because America hasn't been able to process the defeat suffered there, and the war gets a part in hundreds of books and films even today. Besides Good Morning Vietnam, we may remember the films Apocalypse Now, Platoon, and Rambo. In the summer of 1963, in the Bay of Tonkini, two American warships were attacked, which was a good pretext for the American President and Congress to deal a blow to the country as an answer. The American Army, equipped with the most modern military equipment, didn't reckon with the endowments of the country, as neither Napoleon nor Hitler had when they were defeated by the unimaginable Russian winter. The American troops fighting in Vietnam were defeated by the jungle. After their first serious losses, 
the Vietnamese tried to avoid big confrontations and waged guerrilla war, which was successful in the long term. They built hiding places and traps for their enemies in the impenetrable jungle, viable only by them. The country was broken into two parts in 1956 at the conference in Geneva. The communist North Vietnam and South Vietnam, supporting the West. They were separated by the 17th latitude. The South supported the United States and hoped for economic help from them, while the communist hope was the Soviet Union. The country hadn't been able to recover after the war against the French, and immediately it found itself in the clashing point of the great powers. After 12 years of bloody fighting and the failure of several diplomatic negotiations, the South capitulated. In 1975, the war in which 58,000 Americans, 250,000 South Vietnamese, and almost one million North Vietnamese died, was finished. The number of civilian victims reached four million. The economic damage is inestimable. In all Asian countries, we can find passenger transporting vehicles that come from the Chinese rickshaw. Tricycles, in the back of which two passengers may have a seat, are still common in China. Motorized versions of this also emerged in Hong Kong, Indonesia, and Thailand, where they have a nickname of tuk-tuk, named after their typical sound. The vehicles similar to rickshaws are called cyclos in Vietnam. The name of the smaller lake lying southeast of Lake Great West is Huan Kim. In the middle of the lake is the famous Turtle Tower on a small island. Emperor Li Tai To, who lived between 974 and 1028, was the founder of Hanoi and the inhabitants of the city think of him with gratitude. His statue can be found in the park named after him at Lake Huan Kim. Of course, there's a legend about the lake and the tower. When China attacked the country during the reign of Emperor Le Lua, a gold turtle emerged out of the sea with a sword in its mouth. The emperor triumphed over his enemies with the help of this sword, and as gratitude, he had the tower built. The turtle appeared again, and took back the sword so that he could bring it back again if great danger threatened Vietnam, which was reigned by the Li dynasty for a long time. Li Loi gave the lake the name Huan Kim, meaning given back sword. On the small island of Lake Ngot Son, a temple stands in memory of Trang Hung Dao, who was honored in the war against the Mongols. On the east side of the lake, approximately on the side of the main post office, the Five Dragons Pagoda used to stand, and off to the west, where inside the Hanoi Fortress a war history museum can be found, the Emperor's Palace lay. It wasn't just one palace, but a real city consisting of palaces, administration buildings surrounded by a wall, and as in Peking, it was called the Forbidden City. Unfortunately, Nothing has remained by now. We can meet only reconstructed drawings in museums. Thus, we have no idea of the pomp and luxury that characterized the emperor's court. 15 lakes of various sizes can be found inside the city. All of the larger ones have an island with a temple, pagoda, or monument. There are a lot of puppet shows in the world, but there isn't such a unique one as the aquatic puppet show in Hanoi. The company, led by Lee Van Gnugo, often plays at cultural festivals abroad to spread the fame of their country.
The idea of the aquatic puppet show is alleged to have been born in the minds of the people working in the paddies. The puppet actors move their marionettes behind the curtains while standing in the water up to their knees. In their program consisting of 17 scenes, they perform, for example, how Emperor Li Loy met the turtle bringing the sword and many other Vietnamese legends. They mainly perform legends that foreign visitors may be familiar with. Unicorns, dragons, and lions start dancing, and we can see the dance of holy animals too. We can see budding patties, buffalo pulling the yoke, harvest, and fishing, that is the activities which have become common during the centuries, but we can have a look at the life of the imperial court. A special technique makes it possible for a fire-spitting dragon to emerge from the water. Anybody who's ever eaten in a Chinese restaurant has some idea of Vietnamese cuisine too. Especially if that restaurant was in China or Hong Kong. Anybody who's been to Thailand, Malaysia or Indonesia is familiar with dishes that can be found here, but of course, they're a little bit different. All the same, they come from the same roots. According to many people, Vietnamese cuisine is less hot and less spicy than the Chinese one, which is why some foreigners prefer it. In France, for example, there are at least as many Vietnamese restaurants as Chinese, and they're very popular. According to Quentin Cruz's International Menu Guide, due to the French colonists, Vietnamese cuisine has more sophisticated and refined flavors than other Southeast Asian cuisines. The main food is rice, of course. Vô, which they eat in soup, is a kind of pasta made of rice flour, but they also eat it without soup in an endless number of ways, with beef, chicken, fish, or mussels, for example. Chow is like a vegetable dish, seasoned with vinegar and garlic. Rice is also served as a side dish with vegetables, meat, and fish. While in Europe we're only starting to become acquainted with basmati rice, jasmine rice, and wild rice, countless kinds of them are for sale here. They can be seen in baskets next to each other at the markets. Zoi, a sticky rice which is different from steamed rice, is very popular. Rice can be mixed with beans, hazelnuts, or eggs, for example. They make small dumplings from the sticky rice, which can be eaten with chopsticks more easily. In Vietnam, People eat meat as well, like chicken, duck, beef, and pork. The most exotic, but terrible for Europeans, is dog meat, which is so widespread here that there are small diners specialized in it. Of course, not every kind of dog is suitable for eating. They're bred for this purpose. By comparison, 
Roast worm is a delicacy here. Vietnam has a long coast, which is why dishes made from fish and seafood abound. Possibly influenced by the French, they like eating snails and snakes. Ha Long Bay is one of the most beautiful natural sights of Vietnam. Old motor-driven wooden barges wait for tourists getting off the bus, and then balancing on teetering planks, they climb onto one barge after another until they get to the one assigned to them. The name means Landing Dragon's Bay, and according to a very old legend, when strangers attacked the country, a dragon mother couldn't watch the suffering of the people living here, so she flew in from the sky to offer help. According to the legend, invaders once came here on white sailing boats, destroying pagodas, houses, and gardens, and wanted the Vietnamese to be yoked. Up in the sky, the dragon felt sorry for them and landed. She scattered the bay with pearls, which turned into jade stones in the water. The stones shattered the fleet, and then when she was out of stones, she stood in the way of the boats with her body so she was able to rescue the people living here, who respect the dragon that the bay was named after. Fishermen say it occurs at hazy dawn that curious dragon heads rise out of the waves. But scientists think the islands arose 500 million years ago when the surrounding mountains sank into the sea. The height of these limestone cones is about 50 to 200 meters, and this is the largest sea karst formation. The limestone cones of various shapes are worn away by erosion and salty seawater, so they're always changing throughout the decades and centuries. Romantic coasts form a border to the small islands, and in the cliffs, countless caves hollowed by wind and water can be found. There are also dazzling limestone cliffs and bare bluffs, but most of them are covered by green flora. Because they have a sugar loaf shape, they aren't suitable for building houses, so they've been able to remain intact. In the bay, we coast alongside floating villages. The small huts were built on poles because the fishermen working here didn't find a horizontal area suitable for building houses. The people living here have done the same thing every day for centuries. The huts are furnished modestly. Rush carpets for sleeping or hammocks, some chairs, a small cooker, and fishing equipment. Here and there, the sounds of a TV or radio working by battery are audible through the slits in the bamboo walls. From the wooden mole of the harbor, steep stairs lead up to the dripstone cave called Hang Sung Sot, which consists of two big rooms. It's true, though, that the first one is 30 meters high. In the second room, called Cheerful Castle, we can see dripstones shaped like humans and animals. As the flickering light infiltrates through the side entrances, we feel as if the fairy creatures around us were coming to life. The dripstones hanging from the ceiling are called stalactites. Those on the ground are stalagmites. They grow extremely slowly, but if they meet, they create a lace-like wall. Landing Dragon's Bay is only 150 kilometers from Hanoi, but because of bad roads, the journey may take five hours. This nature reserve joined the list of the World Heritage in 1994. Several films have been shot here. Maybe this is even the most well-known place of the country. There are few such spectacular landscapes in the world 
Only Phang Nga in Thailand can rival with Ha Long. A geologist writes, the remainders of the limestone terrace, which sank because of crustal movements and plate tectonics and were flooded, rise out of the water, forming fantastic island hills. The solvent action of the extremely abundant annual 3,000 to 5,000 millimeters of precipitation, the wash of the sea, and the abrasion created special cliff formations and huge caves in the limestone. The coasts of the tiny islands are meshed by mangrove moors. But most tourists make do with the grand view. The only big inhabited island of Halong Bay is Kat Ba. Over 20 years ago, its whole area was proclaimed a national park. While walking on the island along mangrove woods, watercourses and waterfalls, we can observe the island's exotic birds. Sapa is the biggest city of the mountains along the Chinese border. Vietnam lies on the east side of the Indochina Peninsula. Its shape is like a lengthened S, but local people see it as a reclining dragon. The country is bordered by China, Laos, and Cambodia from the land, and Siam Bay, the South China Sea, and Tonkini Bay from the sea. The land of various surfaces can be divided into five regions. The delta of the Red River, originating in China, which is a 3,000 square kilometer, triangularly shaped plain, the North Highlands, with various sized mountains and highlands and the highest peak of Vietnam, Phan Xi Pant, the Middle Highlands, the lower ranges of which are covered by jungle, the fertile Mekong Delta, the area of which is 13 times as big as the delta of the Red River, and the narrow coastal plain. Near the rivers and on the plains, rice is grown, but other agricultural work is also done here. The most underpopulated area is the central mountain range covered by jungle. The density of population in the two big cities is quite high, with the industry of the country concentrated here. The mountain range on the northwest part of Vietnam is famous for the mountain tribes living here among others, Hmongs and Jiaos, who are easily identified by their colorful tribal costumes and unique jewels. Many people come here to climb the highest peak of the country. Two Hungarian climbers have shared their experiences with readers on the internet. Fanzi Span, with its 3,143 meters, is the highest peak of Vietnam. It can be climbed from Sapa, which is a small town in the mountain near the border of Laos. It's inhabited mainly by tribes, dominated by Hamongs and Jiaos. Everything got off to a good start. We arrived from Hanoi on the night train. From here we went on by bus to Sapa. The sky was clear, the countryside was beautiful, and we didn't have to bargain with the bus driver as the price of the ticket was acceptable. In the afternoon, we started to organize the trip. According to our information, we could hire a guide for six to seven dollars a day. We thought we would ask neither for a porter nor accommodation. We would take tinned food and sleep in a tent. But at the travel agency, there's a routine. That is, for $75, they take you by Jeep to the gate of the mountain, the pass, from where you can walk up to the shelter. They bring your luggage, give you hot food and drink. Then the next day, you can climb the peak then return to the shelter and back home. Instead of this, we went to the nearest village to find somebody who was willing to guide us to the peak. We were able to make an arrangement with somebody. In the morning, we had to arrange some documents, admission tickets to the National Park, and insurance. About half past nine, we left for the pass. It was spitting with rain, but it wasn't very cold, and there was very little fog. We covered the first 10 odd kilometers on the concrete road to the pass where the gate of the mountain stood. Meanwhile, we took pleasure in the view, 
although it was raining more and more heavily. Near the pass, we admired the silver waterfall. The gate of the mountain is made of wood, and there was a building where one of the workers of the National Park checked our documents. Wishing us a good trip, he cleared the way for us. By this time, it was pouring down and fog descended, or we went into the cloud. Anyway, we couldn't see much. Whether we visit the Landing Dragon's Bay or climb Fancy Pond, or admire the paddies and the silver waterfall, we'd like the weather to be clear and pleasant, especially if we want to take photographs and video. So it's very important to choose the best time to travel to Vietnam. In Europe, those who can afford it go on holiday at least twice a year, and if they don't like winter sports, they escape from the rough European winter. In Indochina, the weather's the best at the time when it's the worst on the continent. There's tropical monsoon climate here, meaning that only two seasons alternate with each other. In the summer months, it's unpleasantly hot and there's a lot of rain. It rains almost every day. It's hot in winter too, but the weather's more pleasant and drier. At the embassy, they say, as a matter of fact, there's no good or bad period to visit Vietnam. When one region is soaked by rain and it's cold or unbearably hot, in the other regions of the country, the sun shines nicely. In the southern part of the country, two seasons can be distinguished. The rainy season lasts from May to November. The dry season lasts from December to April. In the middle regions of the country, the weather is dry from May to October and rainy from December to April. The weather in the mountains is somewhat cooler. At night, the temperature may fall below zero. In the north, cool and wet winters alternate with hot summers. Vietnamese cities are characterized by the narrow, high buildings painted in various pastel colors. The simple facades with balustrades are called Neo-Greek by architects, and we can truly recognize a look of streets in Athens. However, they weren't created to be similar, but because of economic necessity. The price of property here is relatively high, which is why these houses have a small ground space and are expanded upwards. In Vietnam, several Christian churches can be found even in small country towns. Gio Pan Catholic Church is the heritage of the French colonial past. The city Sapa, just like Chiang Mai in Thailand, is known for its night markets. From evening to dawn, the streets and squares turn into a huge marketplace where we can buy incredible things. Because China is so close, we can find goods common at the Chinese markets, like electronical appliances, clothes, or shoes. Those who want to climb mountains or hike can buy a sleeping bag, hiking boots, Wellingtons, tent, Macintosh, tourist stick, but second-hand military equipment can also be bought. We should concentrate on the carvings, embroidery, goldsmith's work, and pottery of the local mountain tribes instead of the goods available all over the world. Their consumer goods and ornaments don't get out of either the country or the province, so they can be bought here only. Chinese tinned food, spices, soup powder, Fresh vegetables, fruit, and sweets are sold here. Like in Laos and Thailand, here too we can find brandy with a snake in the bottle. Asian people think this drink has curative powers. There are also versions in which a scorpion or echidna, ginseng root, or seaweed can be found. The silver waterfall in Vietnamese Tak Bak can be approached from Sapa or the near Kat Kat. 
We can get here by asphalt road, on foot, or by taxi, but there are also hikes, which include the price of the admission tickets organized by travel agencies. From here, we can climb Fancy Pan, but we have to hire a local guide and devote at least three or four days. Average tourists are eager to get to know the members of the mountain tribes. We can buy some really beautiful work of craftsmen and have our pictures taken with them. They gladly show us how they make and embroider their tablecloths, clothes, caps, and bags. We couldn't take a more unique souvenir for those at home, and we can show in the photographs and videos how and where they were made. Huang Lian, the gate of the nature reservation, is a visitor center. Some tribes living here are the relatives of Karens and Mayos of North Thailand. Hmongs can be identified by their blue clothes, Jiaos by their shaved foreheads. Yaos live in South China, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. There are about 50 to 60,000 of them. They're the traders of the mountains, and their habits show Chinese influence. Most tribes are of Tibetan origin, whose ancestors left the country for religious or political reasons and settled down in the neighboring countries, where they mixed with the people living there, mainly with the children of other mountain tribes. Some ethnical groups are a mystery, even for anthropologists. They used to live mainly from agriculture, and they often grow opium. As a result of their so-called clearing-burning agriculture, they migrated from their habitation every eight to ten years. Today, there are more craftsmen and traders among them than farmers, and more and more people can live from curious tourists. Water buffaloes are muscular and shiny black. Farmers wear the same cone-shaped raffia hats as their ancestors. Paddies are terraced and incredibly green. Bamboo huts are shaded by palm trees, and it's impossible to describe the colors of the sunset. The exoticism of the east wafts through everything, so it's impossible to take a bad photo. The tribes direct the water of the mountain springs and bamboo pipes down to their huts standing on poles, which are equipped with all modern conveniences. The water of the river is ice cold but clean and is suitable for drinking, cooking and washing. The fish in the fast-flowing rivers are the prey of the male members of the tribes. The mountains provide the local people not only with fruit and mushrooms, but also firewood. Hue, which is in the middle of the country, is visited by more and more tourists. The city began to flourish at the end of the 19th century when the Nguyen dynasty moved its capital here. Despite the fact that during their reign the country lost its independence and became a French colony, Hue flourished until 1945. That year, the last Vietnamese emperor, Bao Dai, resigned. Hue's main attraction is the emperor's city, or Forbidden City, as it used to be called. Today it's allowed to enter it, although it's true that there isn't much to see. The imperial building, built of wood on a stone base, burnt down during a fire in 1947. In 1968, Hue was able to make a stand against the siege of America for 25 days, which also dealt a blow to the monuments. Some pagodas, halls, and other buildings in the old city have since been reconstructed. As the stone bases of the palace are undamaged, and the plans as well as some drawings and photographs have survived, 
We can hope that the wooden palace will regain its old brilliance by the time reconstruction has been finished. The Forbidden City was really city-sized. It was surrounded by conduit and high walls. The main gate had five entrances. The middle one was used only by the emperor. Two smaller ones were used by officials, mandarins, and soldiers. The two huge gates on the sides were for the emperor's elephants. Ceremonies took place in the first courtyard, the officials standing according to their positions, greeting the emperor. The Supreme Harmony Room was used at more solemn ceremonies. Coronations took place here, and this was where envoys from abroad were welcomed. The Purple Palace was the private suite of the Emperor and his family. Besides them, only the most important servants were allowed to enter here, including the concubines with their guards, eunuchs, the cooks, servers, cleaners, and court musicians, as well as the actors acting in the theater of the Purple Palace. Thus, this group of servants consisted of hundreds of people. The size of the Purple Palace was accordingly big. The nine-meter walls surrounded an approximately 300 by 300 meter area. Inside the walls, palaces, terraces, halls, pavilions, gardens, and theaters could be found. Emperor Jia Long's palace stood here for 141 years, its former pomp can be imagined only with the help of the informative signs. Being a concubine was not all that luxurious as it may seem to be. It's true that the chosen girl was given everything. Even more, she could support her family as well. But she wasn't allowed to meet her relatives, and she needed a special permission to meet and speak to her mother only from behind a bamboo screen. If she fell ill, the doctor wasn't allowed to talk to her and was only allowed to feel her pulse. There were nine classes of concubines whose clothes were different according to this ranking. Newcomers first had to acquire the etiquette of the court. In the first half year, they didn't dare to say a word, lest they make a mistake. The emperor's officials, in the interest of their own progress, often offered their daughters of their own accord. On the riverbank, outside the walls of the Emperor's city, a pleasant park can be found, flanked by hotels and restaurants. The old city is called Citadel, although it was never a citadel, and hardly anything of it can be seen. But on its flag tower, the red flag with yellow stars flies proudly, and its friendly streets invite us for a walk. Emperor Tuduk is recorded to have had 104 concubines guarded by eunuchs. We don't know how many of them he really used. His successor, Min Mang, is recorded to have slept with five women each night, the result of which was 142 children produced by him. In the theater, classical Chinese plays were performed to entertain the emperor. After lunch, five concubines fulfilled his every wish. One of them prepared his tobacco for him, another one sang, another fanned him. The emperor's meals consisted of 50 courses every day, which were made by 50 cooks. Rice was sorted grain by grain, and of course there were people who tasted the dishes before serving. The descendants of the emperor's cooks still live in Hui, so in the restaurants here we can find some really enjoyable special dishes. There's no one to taste test before us, but there probably isn't anyone who would like to poison us. By all means, we should have a look at the bronze urns as tall as a human being symbolizing the power of the Nguyen Nidisti. They survived the centuries safely. The nine urns weigh 2.5 tons each. Each was dedicated to an emperor and was decorated with carvings depicting landscapes, the moon, the sun, and the clouds.
The monarchs of the Nguyen dynasty are buried in the cemetery known as the Emperor Tombs of Hui, south of the city. The ruinous cemetery is part of the world heritage and is being renovated. The fourth emperor of the dynasty, Tuduk, was a philosopher, historian, and poet who wrote 4,000 poems. He planned his own tomb complex on a small island of a pond. The curiosity of the lavish tomb is that the emperor's carved sarcophagus is empty. It isn't known where the emperor really rests because the 100 servants taking part in his funeral were executed. The market in Hue meets the everyday needs of the people living here, and it isn't a place made for tourists. Maybe that's why it's interesting. Coconuts, mangoes, bananas, and pineapples are sold by their growers, but there are also pots and pans, household commodities, and flowers. At the market, skillful women make incense sticks of various scents, which are well known all over the world. Other craftsmen make various hats of raffia, cane, and bamboo. The sculptors also make their work of various materials and subjects in front of our eyes. The majority of the statues made of porcelain, clay, and wood depict Buddha and known figures of Vietnamese tales and legends. Barfun, that is the fragrant river, which flows through Hue, is the third most important river in Vietnam. By boat, we can approach the famous Emperor Tombs. The tomb of the founder of the Nguyen dynasty, Gia Long, was built on one of the small islands of the river. The tomb of Min Mang, who had 33 wives, countless concubines, and 142 children, was built in a huge park according to the maxims of classical Chinese architecture. The tomb of his son, Tiu Tri, can be found nearby, which is like a miniature of his father's. Experts think Kai Din's tomb mixes the features of Vietnamese and European styles in the most beautiful way. The Tian Mu Pagoda was established at the beginning of the 1600s. The 21-meter-high, seven-story building with an octagon-shaped ground plan was built in 1844 and can be seen even today. The legend says the founder Nguyen Huang met an old woman who told him to go east along the river Parfum and take an incense stick with him. He should build a pagoda at the place where it burnt out. And so he did. The Tian Mu Pagoda is famous for being the center of the opposition movement in the 1960s. In 1963, Thich Quang Duc burned himself to death to protest against the measures of the Vietnamese president. The photos taken of his protest traveled throughout the world press. Today, everything is much more peaceful. Monks with heads shaven bald wearing crocus yellow and light blue gowns and apprentices walk among the walls, which have witnessed a lot. We pass ships decorated with colorful dragon heads and depicting sea snakes and other monsters, and we go on coasting towards the southeast, towards Hoi An. The coast of Hoi An is four kilometers from the city on the east. We can reach here by taking part in an organized trip, but we can go by Ciclo. In the waters on the coasts, fishermen can expect an abundant catch. 
In the sea, they can catch herring and mackerel and sawfish, but the fresh water is also full of fish. There are a lot of kinds of crabs and turtles, which are often seen in the kitchens. On the coast, we can often encounter otters, which are water mammals with shiny fur. Among reptiles, geckos and lizards are worth mentioning. Both are very useful as they eat mosquitoes and flies, so they protect us from many inconveniences. The beach gives us all the facilities that the beaches in Southeast Asia usually do, including diving. Two big companies deal with diving instruction, lending necessary equipment, and guiding tourists. We can hire a surfboard, boat, or catamaran. We have to pay for a deck chair and parasols, but they don't cost much. Hoi An's sandy beach with palm trees lies where Tokini Bay meets the South China Sea. This side sea of the Pacific Ocean attracts bathers with its friendly turquoise blue water, pleasant temperature, and spectacular snow white waves. On the beach, those obsessed with sunbathing can lie, while a little further from the beach, coconut palms offer welcome shade. The yellow, orange, blood red, purple, and gold play of light and the soft darkness over the sea provide us with an unforgettable sight, just like the tiny colorful lamps floating on the sea. Hoian City lies south of Hui and Da Nang, in the middle of the country. Its beach is a popular seaside resort, and its old town has been a part of the world heritage since 1999. Despite this, not much reminds us of its former greatness. Hoi An used to be the busiest and most important harbor of all Southeast Asia. Arab travelers mentioned it in the 10th century but it had its heyday starting in the 17th century. Its harbor was the meeting point for English, French, Dutch, and Portuguese commercial ships, Japanese sailing boats, and Chinese junks. Among these ships' beautiful opium clippers, the fastest boats ever built, lay at anchor. All the fitments of the boats were made of copper and brass and mahogany. Their sails were made of the best canvas, and they were always left with brand new ropes, wrote James Clowell, who always brought the exotic East to mind in his adventure stories. The main attraction of the city is the ornate covered bridge, which was built by Japanese tradesmen. Tradesmen often waited for months for a favorable wind to get home. Until the wind arrived in Hoi An, they hired houses and storehouses for their products, waiting for transport. Many of them married a Vietnamese woman and didn't want to sail away anymore. However, if he did, he left administrators here so that the business could go on smoothly. Initially, the majority of the people were Japanese, but then by the 18th century, the number of the Chinese tradesmen reached 10,000. Their colony was divided into groups according to their place of origin. They built an ornate hall which functioned as a real community house. It was used for meetings and celebrations and as a church built in honor of their ancestors. 
the flourish was ended by the slow, natural filling of the Two Bone River. After this, the big ocean liners docked in Da Nang. Foreign traders walk along the streets of the city even today so that they can make purchases for their shops. And of course, individual customers and tourists who like bargaining for a nice fan, rice paper lamp, or bamboo basket also come here. Wood carvers from here are famous for their nice work all over the country. Rice paper is used to make lamps and lampions, which are popular abroad. Colorfully painted fans of various sizes are made of rice paper, but exercise books and photo albums are also bound in it. Inlay pictures are made by skillful hands and endless patience. They're special because of the wood cut thin as hair, bark strips, bamboo and raffia pieces, and the various colors of which form the picture. In local restaurants, music such as this is presented to those interested in genuine, original culture. Forty kilometers from Hoi An, we can find Mi Son, the religious center of the Kham civilization, which also belongs to the World Heritage. The brick buildings, which can be seen even today, were built in the 6th century, but there had been wooden sanctuaries here two centuries before. For six centuries, the successive monarchs had temples built one after another in honor of former kings and gods, whose forms became mixed in their faith. The importance of Misan started to decrease after flourishing for six centuries, then for another six centuries, it was forgotten totally. Only at the end of the 19th century did French archaeologists find its ruins. They started to excavate it, and then politics interfered. Only 25 towers of the former 70 towers can be seen today, though the Americans did everything to destroy the monument. Vietnamese guerrillas hid among the ruins, making the area a favorite target of bombers. The outer appearance of the group of temples reminds us of Ayute, but especially Angkor. Though its appearance at its peak is no longer visible, the shape of the remaining red brick towers is similar to the Khmer religious centers of the region. But we mustn't forget that in the case of Misan, we're talking about Kham culture, which may be older than that of the Khmer. Angkor in Cambodia, which is the biggest building complex of this type in the region, was built around 1100, when Misan had already been built. It had been built by the Kampa monarchy, who lived in what is the southern part of Vietnam today, and rebelled against Khmer monarchs, invaded, and burnt Angkor. Two or three centuries later, Thai kings attacked it and burned the reconstructed Angkor, and then they built their own capital, Ayutthaya. Misan is interesting not only because of its history, but also its architecture. We've become accustomed to the habit of laying bricks and mortar mixed with cement and lime. Here, the bricks were stuck together with a kind of resin from a pine-like plant. Around the finished building, a bonfire may have been lit to help the material solidify. In this way, they got such strong binding without gaps that it became possible to carve the reliefs directly in the brick walls. Near the ruins, graceful dancers offer folk dances to entertain the visitors.
we go on towards the south, towards the former capital. The former Saigon has been called Ho Chi Minh since 1975, and if we don't know it from anywhere, we must have heard it from the musical entitled Miss Saigon. It lies in the south of the country, only 20 kilometers from the border of Cambodia, but 1,760 kilometers from the capital of today, Hanoi, with which it's linked with railways and public roads. Over six million people live on its 2,000 square kilometers. Pagoda construction is as typical of Vietnam as China or Japan. A technical book on Far East architecture writes, the main buildings of the Buddhist temples are the main hall and the pagoda. These buildings stand on a square courtyard enriched with a covered corridor, a distant relative of the medieval ambulatory. An inner gate leads to the inner courtyard. The house of reading to people, the hall of teaching, the repository of holy books and relics, bell hall, and priests and monks sleeping halls belong to this group of buildings. Offices, official and farm buildings, storehouses, dining rooms, and a lot of other various sized establishments completed the building complex, which was arranged following the Chinese pattern. It's typical of Saigon that among the Asian pagodas we can find more French-styled buildings than in other parts of the country. Buddhist believers often buy songbirds in cages. They're sold near the temples and have the significance that believers are allowed to let them fly away, thus paying off the good actions for that day. There's a shocking number of bikers and motorcyclists. The proportion is the following, 3 million motorbikes and 400,000 cars. Today, the building that had been built for the Indo-Chinese French governor is called Palace of Reunification. After the French left the country, it became the Vietnamese Prime Minister's residence. He called it the Palace of Independence. In 1962, the building suffered such serious damage that it had to be reconstructed almost entirely. The new 20,000 square meter building was planned by Ngo Viet Thu. In the park, we can see the famous tank that broke through the gates of the palace on the 30th of April, 1975. This was the end of the Vietnam War. The ornate palace built by the French between 1901 and 1908 is used today as the town council, and that's why it can't be visited inside. The building is called Hotel de Ville. We may not need to go to the main post office, but the building is so beautiful that it's worth it just to take a look. There's life in the streets. Motorcyclists, cyclists, and pedestrians hurry home to do their business. But there are those who can sleep peacefully, even in this chaos. Notre Dame Cathedral was built by the French between 1877 and 1883. It's one of the most beautiful Christian churches in Vietnam. In front of it, the Statue of the Virgin can be seen. Ho Chi Minh is famous for its markets too. Ben Tan is the best known marketplace in the city. Its facade, built by the French, has become the symbol of Saigon. In front of it, in the roundabout, Tran Nguyen Hai's equestrian statue can be found on a modern pedestal. The stalls selling vegetables, fruit, and flowers are very exotic. There's a lot of sunshine and high humidity, which are both favorable for growing plants. The jewel of the flower markets is the orchid, which has several shapes and colors. At the stalls of the fruit sellers, less known fruit are for sale, such as rambuta, lychee, pomelo, mango, carambola, kumquat, papaya, and avocado. 
from which unusual works of fine art are made. Chi War History Park is a multi-level system of tunnels which is 200 kilometers long. The establishment lying 70 kilometers from Ho Chi Minh City, the former Saigon, is now a museum. The Vin Mok tunnels were dug by country people to ride out the bombings 15 to 20 meters deep under the ground. Chu Chi tunnels were built by soldiers so that they could attack the enemy from there. In the visitor center, a film in English shows how the tunnels were built and how people lived ate, slept, and debated in them. We can see archive records made by correspondents. Then we can walk along the corridors and look at the rooms. The corridors have been widened so that tourists can enter. One of the strategies used to be that big and tall American soldiers got stuck in the narrowing corridors through which small-figured Vietnamese could pass easily. At the military workshop, we can buy souvenirs and on the local range, we can try out some weapons of that time for a sizable fee. The sap of the rubber tree is the basic material of rubber production. The seeds of the originally Latin American tree were smuggled to Southeast Asia by Henry Wickman. The trees, which can be as high as 40 meters, are suitable for rubber production from the age of five or six. The bark of the tree is ripped up with a special knife. Along the cut, running in a spiral shape, the sap of the tree drips down into a small pot fixed to the tree. The 4,220 kilometer long Mekong River originates in the Tibetan highlands. Its delta is 40,000 square kilometers. In rainy season, the river can't transport the huge amount of water which swells Lake Ton Le Sap in Cambodia. On more than a fourth of the delta region, there's intensive rice cultivation, but fishing is also important. Fishermen, farmers, and craftsmen live in the villages standing on poles. There are one, two, or three-day trips organized to visit these villages. The activities and prices of the bus trips from Ho Chi Minh City are very similar. An entry in a guidebook says, Bao Din channels can be reached after a two-hour journey. From here, we can reach the city Mai To by boat. Mai to is a typical water city with inhabitants traveling by boat and with houses standing on poles in the water. There's always a one-hour free program here at the market where everybody can go shopping. Surprisingly, the sellers sell their goods at sensible prices. From here, the group goes on by boat to visit the four islands, the islands of Turtle, Dragon, Unicorn, and Phoenix. Lunch is usually eaten on the island of Turtle, we can see everywhere that huge eyes are painted on the bow of the boats. Legend has it that they're painted to frighten away the water monsters. Seeing the huge eyes, the wicked water monsters believe that they've met an even bigger monster, so they run away. Instead of asphalt, there's water. Instead of cars, there are boats. The world of the channels is really special. 
The coasts are populated by huts built on poles, the bamboo framework of which is covered by rush. The roofs are made of palm leaves, but they use tin as well. Narrow wooden planks lying on pails are used as sidewalks. Through the openings, we can see inside the huts, so the people of the huts live their lives under the public eye. Craftsmen also live here, and some of them live on raffia spinning, making rush, baskets, and hats. The men's main activity is fishing, and many of them are involved in trade and transportation of goods. The channels have their own market, as every settlement does, because the goods for everyday life need to be bought somewhere. At the floating market, the boats are the stalls. On all boats, there's a stick rising up to the sky where the goods to be sold are hung. You can buy food, vegetables, fruit, lamps, matches, pots and pans, even clothes. The barges are sometimes so packed that it's a wonder they don't sink under the weight of melons, cabbages, or pineapples. The rowers and riders weave in and out with fantastic mastery in the chaos without any traffic rules. Fishermen move the fresh catch from their boat to a smaller one, and they start down the channels on them. Of course, there are wholesale purchasers, but housewives can't resist the goods still alive. Not only fish are caught in the nets, but also mussels, crabs, and other seafood, which they chop up with scissors, roast, and eat. In the small refectories set up on boats or in palm huts, we can try these extraordinary dishes. Asian people peel pineapples with their huge knives amazingly fast and skillfully. There are few more delicious delicacies than fresh pineapples. The boats groan with piles of the fresh spiny fruits and coconuts. Small factories making rice paper have been set up on the coast because this technology needs a lot of water. The rice paper made in a traditional way is the basic material of not only lamps and lampshades, but it's also used at the press. It's sold in hobby shops all over the world and is used in many ways. Of course, the demand of wholesalers is satisfied by bigger factories. This manufacturer shows tourists the process of production. Travel agencies try to show all the sites of the region, for example an apiary, crocodile farm, or a small factory making sugar. Between the attractions, we can travel by boat.
Coconut candies have been Vietnamese children's big favorite for a long time. They're sold at every market and are made by hand even today with fantastic mastery. The candies are chopped and then wrapped into rice paper, but so fast that we can hardly follow with our eyes. The disorderly network of natural and artificial channels with fishermen and traders living on their coasts is an exotic site of Thailand and Vietnam. It has fascinated the likes of Somerset Moam, Joseph Conrad, Rudyard Kipling, James Clall, and Graham Greene. The world of the channels has hardly changed for centuries. It's a sign of modernization that some of the boats are driven not by paddles, but engines which are put at the end of a long stick, so it's also used as a rudder, and they're lifted out of the water in natural gear. They're filled up at floating petrol stations, which is not an everyday sight. There's no electricity in most huts on poles, but we can hear music coming from battery-operated cassette recorders. Clean drinking water is carried in huge balloons by boats because the water of the channels is not fit for drinking, especially since motorboats are used. Let's see how the geographer Janusz Kubaszek saw the world of the floating market. On the winding channels flanked by palm trees, there's hardly any free surface. Boatmen turn their paddles with magic skills, and they never crash. We can meet floating kitchens as well. In some flat boats, fish and crabs are roasted on live coals. Rice and soup are cooked on a tiny iron cooker. They're handed on plates to the customer, who sits on a boat and also offers something to buy. The colorful side of sellers all over wearing colorful clothes, broad-brimmed cone-shaped raffia hats sitting on their boats, loaded with fruit and vegetables, remains an unforgettable experience forever. <laughs>